Our next speaker served 26 years on active duty United States Army, culminating with his service as the director of the Infantry Futures Group, U.S. Army Infantry Center, Fort Benning, Georgia. He was selected to the Senior Executive Service in February of 2008 and is currently the United States Army Futures Command Director of the Maneuver Capabilities Development and Integration Directorate at Fort Benning, Georgia. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Don Sando. That's all you got? That's all you got? 1,400 seats in here and that's all I get from my 49 closest friends? Hey Brent, thanks for that introduction. Uh, it's, it's certainly my pleasure to be here today and talk with you about Maneuver Force modernization. General Donahoe, sir, thank you for your leadership of the Maneuver Force. Thank you for your leadership of the Fort Benning team. Uh, and thank you and Sergeant Major Garner for your perseverance in enabling us to have this year's Maneuver Warfighting Conference as a hybrid uh, solution. I think we can all agree that uh, diversity of thought uh, and critical debate is necessary for our profession to succeed and build. It is something that should not be suppressed. It should be enabled and encouraged uh, in all forms. Uh, and, I, and I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be part of that today. Uh, one thing Brett didn't tell you <clears throat> is I have the great opportunity every day to come to work with an extremely talented group of soldiers and civilians who have a singular focus every day. Uh, and that's to make our soldiers better, to make our formations better. There is one future, it starts tomorrow. Uh, and how do we do that for our maneuver force? all designed to maintain the battlefield primacy of our soldiers and the formations in which they fight. Uh, it's, it's pretty clear, it's pretty focused. Uh, you get to come to work and you get to hear small arms fire across the road. Uh, if you feel bad about the bureaucracy of our army and how we go about modernizing our force, you go out to the museum, you go out to Harmony Church, you go out to Sand Hill and you see our sons and daughters uh, who are coming to the colors of our nation uh, as we all did. Uh, and it gives you hope, it makes things worthwhile. And then you can come back and be overwhelmed by email uh, and, <clears throat> and presentations and those kinds of things. But it's really pretty good. Uh, Fort Benning, of course, has a history of innovation and experimentation and inspiration. Um, about 95 years ago, guys and I, like Eisenhower and Patton, were here thinking about, hey, what is this automotive, automotive revolution? What does mechanized warfare look like? Uh, their debate and diversity of thought was not necessarily encouraged by their branches, but they did it anyway. Uh, in the 1930s, Marshall is the assistant commandant and how he changed leader development and picking leaders and making leaders responsible, fundamentally changed our army leading into World War II. Uh, Hal Moore and others associated with airborne uh, or the air assault test division in the 60s fundamentally changed our, our application of vertical envelopment uh, for Vietnam. In the 1980s, as TRADOC established all the battle labs to help us to continue to think, and even as we speak today, uh, our battle lab here is uh, in the throes of our annual uh, Army Expeditionary Warrior Experiment, right, which we've, we've been doing for several years in a joint combined fashion. We have Marine Corps participation this year. We have UK and, and Dutch soldiers helping us think about robotics and how we do that. Uh, and of course, as the Maneuver Center of Excellence and all our centers of excellence were established <clears throat> back in FY10, uh, from General Farrader, our first CG, to General Donahoe, our current CG, they've all seized the opportunity to be innovative and creative in how we develop leaders, how we train soldiers, and how we think critically about the, the future. So uh, paid political announcement, if you're looking for work, uh, if you're looking for a place where you can have an impact on the Army for generations, come to Fort Benning, uh, be part of the generating force, help us think. Uh, I'll talk about it later, but as General McKean said, Hey, we're all in this together, right? So the divisions have a stake in this. Our army has a stake in this. Everybody has a voice in this. That debate, that discussion is important because without it, uh, you know, every day's an injury, every day's a movement to contact. We need to have that discussion up front. We'll talk about that. So what I want to do this morning is take a little bit of time talking about how we approach maneuver force modernization. We talked yesterday about the, the change in character war and the operational environment, just to highlight a few things that I think are important to us as we focus on, on the maneuver force, the close fight. Uh, highlight a few of the things that we have underway and in the near future for modernization and probably talk about a few things that I think we're missing. Uh, and then I'll leave, I'll leave you with a couple of uh, parting shots to think about as we continue this, uh, this, this dialogue. So how do we think critically about the problems of future combat? 
when I was younger, when I was a student here, when I was out in the operational force as a, as a company grade officer, I always wondered, who on earth thought of this? You know, who made this stuff up? So for the last quarter century that I've been involved in this part of the Army, well, there is a process of that, and we'll talk about it. Now, every once in a while, you still get that, that moment where you go, whose idea is this? All right, so, so bad ideas can still emerge. But there is a process. We'll talk about that. It starts with a threat, right? You've got to focus on a threat, a problem that the U.S. Army and probably all the DOD suffered dur during the lost decade of the 90s was we didn't have a threat. The Soviet Union quit. Peace broke out all over. We downsized the force, and we went to this capabilities base. Like, say, we're not going to pick an enemy. We're not going to put a face on him. Uh, so we'll just talk generically, right? And there's, there's risk to that. But we do have a pacing threat. It's clear. It's China and it's Russia. They're pure threats, so it's easy to focus. Uh, as you look at that operation environment, you look at technology, you look at how things are going to change on a battlefield, you look at what the other guy's doing, then you got to figure out, how do, what do I have to do to win? What do we want to do to fight the way we need to fight as a joint coalition team? What's that idea, right? So then you get concepts. From those concepts, then you have to you know, derive things that need to change, right? We don't just make up required capabilities. They are derived from how we envision the future operational fight. Those requirements to change go across the .mel PF, right? The domains of doctrine, organization, training, leader development, material, those kinds of things. The hard decision is, okay, what do I invest in when and how do I put it all together, right? So that's good hard staff work. But if you don't get the first part right, you can't ever get the second part right. <clears throat> We've done this before. General Funk talked about it. Uh, General McKean talked about it. Others talked about it uh, in the 70s and 80s going into air land battle, right? So uh, as TRADOC was established, we looked at the 73 Arab-Israeli war and said, what does that mean? What is that? How do we project that on the Soviet Union? How do we project that on a NATO fight in Europe? What is that? What do we need to do to, to be successful? Uh, so we came up with a battlefield development plan, and it wasn't just five shiny things. And we like to talk about the big five, but in Don Sandoz's judgment, the big five started with doctrine. How are you going to fight? And it was airland battle. If you want to fight that way, if you have to fight that way to win, how am I going to change the organization, right? So Division 86, it created the light divisions, but it also created our armored and mechanized infantry divisions. Ten battalions, Davardi, attack helicopters, rockets. If the division has to fight in depth, I have to organize them equipment to do that, right? So we, we had to change the organization. What fundamentally changed our Army were two things. Training, the training centers, right? How we tra train collectively. And in a schoolhouse, small group instruction, all right? You can hide in a 200-man classroom. You can't hide in a small group with 15 of your peers, okay? That fundamentally changed how we developed leaders in the schoolhouses, and it served us well. And I, I, I remember my SGI, and I remember my first OC at the training center. Fundamental impact on our Army. It's, it's, it's very exciting. And oh, by the way, we had, we had some really good equipment, right? The M1, the M2, the 64, the 60, in a patriot, right? But don't get focused on the shiny thing. It's how you fight, and it's the people with whom you fight. That's what matters. And, and obviously, we were pretty successful a generation ago. So as we look to the future, so what do we think, right? So there's a, there's a link to a, a very good TRADOC video. We won't show it today if you want to look at it uh, you know, at any time. And, and, and Ian, I think, who's had a hand in this, will, will, I think we'll speak tomorrow. So as, I look, as we look at that, that operational environment that John Antal talked about, that others talked about, General Yeager talked about urbanization, so what does it mean, right? So these are the things, I think, the big ideas that affect how we go about maneuver force modernization. The battlefield is, is extended, right? So you go back to 1865 or 1863, Gettysburg, 68,000 soldiers on one side, 72,000 on another, shoulder to shoulder, rank on file. That terrain, a generation ago, could be commanded by, you know, a Bradley tank company team, right? Now that same terrain can be controlled by something much smaller. So the battlefield is just naturally becoming extended. Autom uh, autonomous systems, artificial intelligence, satellite communications have all just exp exponentially increased that rate of change, but it's extended. We talked about lethality, right? It's not just precision. It's close enough with a whole bunch, right? right? So a battery six, a battalion six, an MLRS six brings a lot of destruction and it's useful, right? So, so how do you react to that? It's going to be fast, right? John Antal said six, uh, seven seconds to die, okay? It's going to be fast, and if you're not fast, you're, you're not winning. And in order to be fast, in our judgment, you got to be flat, 
right? So, we, so we've grown up in the Army and the military. We've got these nice hierarchical organizations. That's fine. Decisions have to be flat. Capabilities have to be flat. Action has to be flat. And we'll talk about that a little bit. So that, that's how we see it. Uh, so as we go through things, uh, we'll try and highlight some of that. Regardless, our Army's role remains. Seize control, uh, seize terrain, and control populations. Everything else is necessary, right? Targeting, IPB, uh, sustainment, obviously, right? But if you want to achieve sustainable political outcomes consistent with our national interests, you have to close with and destroy. You have to seize terrain and control populations. Our history is replete with examples when we didn't do that and we didn't get that. We didn't seize terrain, we didn't control populations, we did not get a sustainable outcome consistent with our political interests. So you gotta do that. And that's fine, that's, again, small arms fire, large caliber fire. I mean, you hear you know, rifles in the morning and you get to go to bed at night in the, in the city of Columbus and the surrounding areas to uh, mortars, uh, tanks, and Bradley fire. So it's, it's pretty exciting. <clears throat> so what are we doing now to, to focus our modernization, right? So we talked about how we do this, right? So if you look at Pete Jones, right, about seven, eight years ago, we, we did the, uh, the Russian New Generation Warfare Study. So we saw what was going on in Georgia, the country, not the state. We saw what was going on in Crimea. Crimea. We looked at other places. Uh, we said, hey, okay, what, what's changing now that's going to affect us, right? So the Starry Study of 73 was pretty analogous to the, the Jones Study of, of this last decade. And that began our thought on, on multi-domain battle first and then multi-domain operations. What does that mean? Published in December of 18, or uh, yeah, December of 18, here's three big ideas of MDO, right, which we have to nest with as we look at our maneuver concepts. Calibrated force posture. You're there or you got to get there, right? Uh, you know, when I was young, we had two corps and five divisions in Europe. We don't anymore, right? So how do you get there, right? How, how do you do that, right? And, and, and obviously coalitions are part of that. So what does expeditionary mean? Sustainment, how do you make your, your force fast? Uh, but then there's the trade-off between being expeditionary and being sustainable, right? So if you don't have sufficient capability uh, and sustaining power to achieve those objectives, you won't be there, right? Plenty of examples in history of forces that were expeditionary and sent home. Uh, Multi-domain formations, right? So you'll hear that the core is the center of convergence for MDO. That may be true, but every formation is fighting and must be aware of all domains, okay? I may not be flying satellites as a maneuver brigade commander, but I'm affected by them. If I don't understand space operations and what's happening to me and what's, what the enemy's doing to me, uh, I'm at a loss. So I have to have that capability. I have to have capacity. I have to have endurance. I have to be understanding in all those domains. And then convergence, right? So if you think of airland battle and you think of air and, and ground operations and stacking overlays, well, so now we got five domains and not two, and we have the information and electronic warfare environments. Again, I think John Antall talked about the five-dimensional chest, right? So, so you're just applying, you know, if you go back to the, I think the 43 edition of 100S5 that defines, uh, you know, maneuver, the flexible application of combat power in all domains to place the enemy in a position of disadvantage. That's what you're doing in converging effects and domains. It's all to create conditions for your subordinate organizations. It's all does, you know, convergence in and of itself achieves nothing. It establishes conditions for somebody else to do something. All right, so force posture, multi-domain formations, and convergence. Subordinate to that, right, so the Army asks, hey, all the, all the branch proponents, those functional proponents, need to write functional concepts. So we wrote cross-domain maneuver. Uh, published originally in 17 and then updated in, uh, in uh, 2020, right? Because again, we, we don't write concepts in, 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 in serial, we write them in parallel, right? So as we were writing MDO, MD, uh, MDB and MDO, we were writing CDM, right? So as things get updated, you gotta get caught up with the paperwork, right? Well, we snapped the chalk line uh, back in, in 2020 again. And here's the four big ideas about cross-domain maneuver, which really drive and help focus our modernization efforts. First thing is, hey, we're operating within corps and divisions, right? So we're the proponent for brigade and below. We're operating within, within the construct of corps and divisions. <clears throat> we have to know what corps and divisions do and what conditions they're going to establish so that our maneuver brigades can, can be successful. Reconnaissance and security at all echelons. 
Anybody who thinks, all right, I mean, if you walk down the sixth, the sixth floor, I think on the East Wing, right, the Armor Branch, fundamentals of reconnaissance and security, right? You can't forget them. They apply in today's battlefield, they apply in tomorrow's battlefield. How do I do reconnaissance and security in all domains and all echelons? To paraphrase uh, uh, Thunderbolt 6, we want divisions to do division things. Divisions need cavalry. It's not General Farrell's cavalry squadron from OIF-1, right? It's an all-domain reconnaissance and security. What does that look like? We're not sure, but we know for sure, we're very certain, that the corps, divisions, brigades, battalions have to do reconnaissance and security. It's a requirement for commanders at all echelons. So what does that look like, right? But you have to do that. Don't think that you don't. Don't think because uh, you're different that you don't need to do that. Operate semi-independently. We struggle with that term here at Fort Benning since we first wrote it. What does that mean? Is that, you know, an armored cavalry regiment, you know, running to the guns? Well, I don't know, all right? So what we tried to describe is you may or may not be in direct support uh, or, or in supporting range of, of your adjacent unit, right? You may or may not have communications or lines of communication for logistics established. You may have to be on your own from time to time, which is nested with the last one. Execute command control, execute mission command. General Funk talked about it, right? Discipline initiative within commander's intent. If you have to wait for permission from your higher headquarters on a fast, flat, lethal battlefield, you're wrong. Okay, so, so what does that mean? So we struggle with semi-independently. Uh, you're gonna be contested in all environments at all the times. Doesn't mean that you will be denied in all environments at all the time, but you're gonna be, it's gonna come and go, right? Nobody could ever get me on a radio, but that's another story. All right, so those are the four big ideas across domain maneuvers. So, so if you think of air land battle as the operating concept and combined arms maneuver is the subordinate idea, multi-domain operations is the operating concept and cross-domain maneuver is, is the subordinate idea. We talked about it. The division is the focus uh, of, our, of our tactical fight, all right? We talked about 3.0. General Funk says it's going to be out in June. If you haven't had a chance to read the draft, read it and tear it up. I mean, I'm, I'm, give that feedback back to the author. I don't mean tear it up, right? Be very critical of it, right? Because if you go back to the 80s, right, active defense was replaced by Airland Battle 1, which was replaced by Airland Battle 2. You can't get it right if you don't ever start. And I'll tell, I'll just go out on a limb right now. 3.0 is not good, okay? It's not good as written because you have to be involved in it, right? Uh, <clears throat> the battalion and brigade commanders who are going to fight the Army of 2030, have left McGinnis Wickham Hall. Your division planners have left McGinnis Wickham Hall. We're not gonna touch these kids again by the Army of 2030. They'll come back for two weeks of the maneuver pre-command course, right? And that's, I mean, that's obviously a great, a great opportunity, but that army is in place. The secretary just signed r struck 2428. So we've got a year and a half to, to set the Army of 2030. And the leaders, the men and women who are gonna be responsible for this, have left our building, all right? So you need to look at that, have your smart kids look at it and provide feedback, right? It's a pain in the neck because I know you're busy, but you got to do that. Please help us on that. It's the tactical fighting organization. It's structured for large scale combat operations. It's got to integrate in all domains as we all do. And it's going to be fast and extended. We know that. And I'm glad uh, CASCOM CG is here. It's a, it's a tough business. And I think if we look at supply from a demand base and not a supply base, right? If we look at sustainment, I think if we even look at the network from a demand perspective and not a supply perspective, we may get a, a, a different solution to that, but I would be happy to talk about that. Okay, so let's talk about our brigades, right? Armor, big nasty, right? The combat armor decision, right? ABCTs, eight years ago we had 13 manned ABCTs, we have 16 today. We know that we need armor formations, right? If you're gonna seize, uh, train and control populations, if you're gonna go, if you're gonna have a gun, big guns are better, right? If you're gonna have bullets, smart bullets are better, right? So here's what we're doing for our armor formations. We're fielding, uh, about to field the AMP round, advanced multi-purpose round, consolidate the capabilities of a number of rounds into one. Third gen FLIR, we need third gen FLIR to incorporate aided target recognition, right? So hey, Gunner Sando, if you're busy out there and you, and, and you, you may not be, see, you know, there's a target you might be interested in, right? to help gunners, help commanders. If you need third gen FLIR to do that, it's not just about the range of third gen FLIR, it's the, it's the quality uh, of, your, of your, uh, what you can see from barrel uh, to range, so it's pretty good. 
Armored Assault Company, right? So we talked about the last big five. Organizational change is important. So one thing we're doing here at the Maneuver Center with the Armor School and General Donahoe's lead is restructure our mechanized infantry into what we're calling armored assault companies. This is in it, you know, it does a couple things, right? Uh, it structures us so that we can field Ross Kaufman's obsolete man fighting vehicle when it shows up, right? And he'll talk about that later. Uh, 14 vehicles in a company today. We know the difficulties of the Bradley, you know, it, you know, it, it's un, undergunned. Uh, it's too small to carry everybody we need. So we're reorganizing 14 Bradleys into two platoons of six. We're changing the crew of the Bradley from infantry to armor. I think 19 Charlies, the MOS that we're, we're looking at. Uh, that's what we're advocating for. That's what's working through the system. Uh, that will be announced maybe around Easter, okay? Armored Assault Company. So I'm going to change the P, personnel, and I'm going to change O, organization, in our Armored Assault Companies to support M, the future uh, optionally manned fighting vehicle, to get ahead of this, right? So we don't want to wait until the OMFE shows up and says, hey, gee, I need to reorganize, right? We want to do it all the time, right? So General Richardson and the first CAV pilot for, uh, for Division CAV, right? So you got to do all these, all these things kind of in parallel. You can't wait for one to do the other. Uh, mobility, right? So we're, we're filling the Joint Assault Bridge. Uh, AMPV is going through IOT&E with 3rd Division uh, here in, in the next few weeks. That's great. And we're fielding the M2A4. Just something about the Bradley, right? All right. So the A3 was fielded at the turn of the century. All right. Now we're finally getting around to upgrading the M2A3 to the M2A4, right? So we kind of paused on the Bradley during the FCS days. That didn't work out, and they said, hey, you better get caught up. And then we've tried a couple of times to fix it. Ross is working on it to, to replace that. We know that it needs fixing. Uh, the transition between Bradley's and OMFE and how the Army does that, that's to be determined, but that, that's out there today. And vehicle protection suite. It's more than active protection system, right? It's preemptive detection of sensors and shooters. It's preemptive destruction of sensors and shooters. It's passive and reactive protection at the vehicle itself, right? Uh, there's all kinds of things we can go in detail about that if you need to, at, you know, in a different session. Uh, but vehicle protection suite, that's the point force protection aspect of our combat vehicles. How do I get to formation pr protection and formation defense to defend against what John Antall talked about uh, and Colonel Doherty, U.S. Air Force, that just talked about, and, and I'll get to that when I talk about robotics. How do I get to that collective protection of that, what I'll call key terrain, that low altitude airspace over the maneuver formation? But hey, our ABCTs are in pretty good shape. We're moving out on those things. We still need a tank. Uh, instantaneous catastrophic destruction from any angle. When I pull the trigger, I know what happens, right? We're not walking away from that at all. The Marine Corps did, we're not. Uh, the infantry, right? So we have 33 infantry brigades uh, in the total force, 16 A's and nine S's, I guess, and five S fabs. So what are we doing for the infantry, right? Mobile protective firepower. We've trained with those prototypes at Fort Bragg. We've shot them at Fort Stewart. Uh, they're in the throes of, you know, whatever the buyers and sellers do and how they negotiate what they're gonna do. That's, that's out there, so we can't get a lot of detail. But why are we building mobile protective firepower? So you gotta go back to the combat vehicle modernization strategy of 2015, which talks about the, the difficulties we had, with the tactical difficulties we have with infantry. They're not very fast, they're not very protected, and they're not very lethal. But we got a bunch of them because they're cheap, right? 33 out of 58 BCTs are infantry, right? So how can we do that? Knowing that we had to probably offset our, our entry into a theater, right? Joint forcible entry is, is one way to get there. I can't do that with everybody. So how do I offset the introduction of my infantry and get them from where they, they are to where they need to be? So I need to move them fast, right? Infantry squad vehicle. We did prototypes with the ground mobility vehicle. We did prototypes with the Army ground mobi mobility vehicle. Uh, we're fielding the infantry squad vehicle uh, to help move our infantry uh, greater distances in a, in a faster period of time. It's not protected. It's not designed to. It's designed to move pretty fast. If we're going to move fast, we have to have effectively organized and equipped uh, cavalry organizations to enable the movement of that formation. Our current vehicles for uh, light cavalry are insufficient. Humvees, LRVs, MRAPs, MATVs, JLT, you name them, they're not effective, right? I can't put a six-man scout squad in there. Uh, so we're designing the light reconnaissance vehicle. We think it's going to be hybrid electric. Uh, we can talk about that at length in, in questions if you want to. 
It's because it gives me power. It's because it can operate all my, my sensor suites that I'm going to have on that vehicle. It gives me silent watch and silent mobility to a degree. It helps me move. It kind of gets to what John Antall talked about. How do I mask, right? Uh, you know, electric motors have like zero thermal signature compared to an internal combustion engine. But I would need to move the infantry. I got I to, gotta, you know, protect them as they move or, or enable the movement. And then if, once I come across something that's going to slow that movement, I got to resolve that firefight, MPF, right? Hit the button, it goes away, right? So you go to JRTC, infantry battalions can be stopped for a long time by a couple of medium machine guns. MPF stops that. It ends that firefight quickly and moves on. We talk about the close fight. We, we have to win a close fight. Every, everybody else can like lose or tie. You can't lose the close fight. We want to only enter it under favorable conditions, but once we're in it, we got to win it, and we got to win it fast, right? And prolonged machine gun duels aren't helpful. MPF solves that. Uh, body armor, all right? Hey, new, new front plate body armor, 20% lighter. Okay, we, we can talk about other things we're trying to do. One thing we're trying to do for commanders is, is to help give you some decision aids. Does everybody need to wear all their body armor all the time? Okay, that's a commander's decision and that commander's decision should be pushed down to the appropriate level. It shouldn't be held at army level and it certainly shouldn't be held in building 70, right? We're gonna try and make body armor lighter, better, you know, all those things. But you gotta determine who's gonna wear what when, okay? So give us some help on that. Striker, all right, so I, I mentioned the, the Bradley, right? A3 fielded at the turn of the century, fielding the A4 now. Striker was conceived, fielded, and modified like four times since we touched Bradley's, all right? You recall that Striker was, was the vehicle of choice to, to enable the, what we, General Shinseki initially called the intermediate or brigade combat team to lead us to FCS, right? So Striker was FCS before FCS was. So we still have Strikers, so we've, we're improving them. 30 millimeter cannon, all right, so we've got them fielded with 2CR in Europe now uh, with their version, and then we're going with the three other brigades with the 30 millimeter. Putting the javelin on the crows, all right, get the gunner away from the gun a little bit, that, that's, that's working out, and we're improving the tow, the tow launchers. Talk about tows, all right? You know, my first platoon, I was a tow platoon leader, right? They're, they're great systems. That was a million years ago. We need a new tow missile, all right? And I'm not interested in range, I'm interested in collaborative engagement, top attack and loitering, right? So to see, again, see what John Antall talked about. Uh, if you look at air launched effects, right, which the, uh, the aviation team is working to, you know, from a, a manned helicopter to extend unmanned aerial systems at range to help see, sense, and destroy the battlefield. If ALE is good for aviators, ground launched effects are good for, for maneuver forces. We have tow launchers in every one of our brigades. I gotta take advantage of them. In fact, we're gonna do that during AEWE next month uh, if you want to know when, come on out. Uh, we're going to fire uh, ALE equivalents out of, out of tow launchers on the ground to see what happens. We've improved mobility, right? So we, we, we up-protected strikers for, during the war. We got caught up with the engine and the powertrain, so we're okay. Uh, and then protection, double B hull, A1. Strikers are great, 108 rifle squads, a lot of infantry. It can help mitigate the fact that seven years ago we took half of our mechanized infantry out of ABCTs. Uh, they are a great operational uh, force. Uh, we love them to death, uh, but they're not armored forces and they're not light infantry, right? So you just got to kind of keep that in mind. Uh, as we talk about converting from modular brigade combat teams to divisions and how we do that, we have to take uh, capability out of our brigades to make the divisions uh, effective. Our caution is don't touch striker brigades until you can put strikers in a division. All right, striker brigades, combat teams as they exist today are pretty good, all right? It gives the commanders, the COCOMs, and everybody else a lot of flexibility. Uh, we're good with reorganizing our armor divisions, right? It, with cavalry, the division artillery, sustainment, all those kinds of things, we kind of know what that looks like. We're very confident in that. Somewhat confident on our infantry formations, right? No confidence in, in, in touching strikers right now, right? So. Uh, the Hippocratic Oath, at first do no harm. Don't touch strikers until you know what you want to do with them, right? Uh, so we're working on that. But striker, uh, striker formations in the platform are in pretty good shape. Robotics and autonomous systems, right? A lot of talk about that. Uh, if, if you have to uh, look at something online when you get home or you want your people to look at it, the Warfighter Corner yesterday with uh, 
with, uh, again, Colonel Doherty, U.S. Air Force, uh, Rob Ryan from our robotics team, and John Antall, right, talks about a lot of these things. Uh, we're working a lot of, you know, ground and air aspects of robotic systems. The secret sauce is AI and a network. There's a little bit of trust involved with that. That's all good. But here's the two big ideas. We think robotics and autonomous systems can extend the area and time over which a formation can be effective, right? So now I can be, I can, you know, we talked about the operational environment. It's extended and it's fast, right? So let me, let me, let me extend my area and let me be faster. And we think uh, RAS and AI can do that. And let's talk about enabling leaders to make better decisions faster, right? So General McKean talked about the divisions in the cores, right? I love you guys and, and, and gals, right? I mean, I was on a core staff. I got, you have scores of field grade officers, non-commissioned officers to help you make decisions. Company and battery and troop commanders have nobody to help them make a decision, okay? They are the least experienced, the least formally educated of our leaders. And they're at the point of the spear and we're, and we're putting them out there. So how can I use AI? You know, what, what, what does that look like to help that company commander, that platoon leader, that troop commander to make a decision faster? It doesn't have to be the best decision, it's better, it's relative to the enemy. How do I do that? If I can network all my sensors in, in, that, are, that are looking at my area, right? So I have all these things going on from the top down, right? I'm helping to understand what the, what the environment looks like, known and suspected enemy locations, all those things. And you get the mission to defend, you know, Hill 68, Orient East against this, right? Time now. Why can't I have a machine take the, the, the doctrinal template that I learned here in, in McGinnis Wilcom Hall and give me a situational template on that piece of ground and say, hey, put your, put your tanks here, put your Bradleys here, put your reserve here, dig now, put your obstacles here, good luck, right? As opposed to, hey, let me think about it, right? Because that, that, poor, that poor commander's got nobody to help him. So how can we do that? And so we're looking at that, right? So we have what we, you'll hear 10X, right? 10X because we're terrible on picking cool names, right? Marine Corps picks cool names for experiments, the Navy does, the Air Force, we don't. We need letters and numbers, right? You know, 10 digits, 26 letters, 10X is what we came up with. But the idea is how can I make a formation 10 times better? Okay, what's better, Sando? What, what's better? Well, I don't know. It's measured in lethality, it's measured in protection, it's measured in mobility, it's measured in situation awareness. It's affected most by training and leader development, and it's adversely affected most by logistics. Okay, we'll figure it out. I want to be better. Can machines make me better? And that's what we think we can do, right? And <clears throat> I mentioned 10X, we also hear uh, AI for small unit maneuver. The Marine Corps have, have, has done this with DARPA for a couple of years. We've been working with DARPA. We've been working with DARPA on lots of other things. Um, it's, re it's real exciting, right? So if you get the opportunity to, to take some things, and we talked about General Richardson and the CAF pilot, we talked about playing and uh, participating in Project Convergence, you get the opportunity to do that. Over the last several years, ForceCom has been wonderful in supporting our experimentation here at Fort Benning, right? <clears throat> Third Division just left most recently. We've had Fourth Division, we've had First Cavalry. Uh, commanders and staffs helping us think about problems, right? So if, if you get that opportunity to send your subordinate organizations to do that, You've been doing it. I can encourage you to continue to do that. Uh, and again, I talked about you know joint coalition experimentation that we're doing. We all look at this, the technology. We all look at the problems. We're all seeing the same kind of issues. What we, how we choose to solve them is, is, can be determined, obviously. Uh, but we need your help. Hey, so a couple of things to think about. Right? And people have talked about this. Soldiers are more important than systems, right? General Funk said soldiers are asymmetric advantage. Clearly. Okay, we invest more in our soldiers and particularly our junior leaders than any other army, right? General Hodney was here, General McKean was here, General Donald, anybody that's been here as a general officer can tell you, chief of staff, chief of staff counterpart visits, right? So chief of staff of another army comes down here. They don't want to go out and see tanks. They don't want to go out and see machine guns. They say, how do you train your non-commissioned officers? How do you train your soldiers? How do you train your lieutenants? That's what they're interested in. I mean, we show them neat things because that's what we do, right? Um, but that's what they're, they're interested in. Training is more important than technology. We all agree, right? So General Heidi can correct me you know, with the details, but as we did the 2008 small arms capability-based assessment, long words for figuring out how to shoot better, right? You looked at the soldier, you looked at his weapon, you looked at the enabling technology, the sights, you looked at the ammunition, 
and tea and sweat is for training. And, you know, I'm, you know, I don't want to uh, <clears throat> be a buzzkill on this, but the, one, the single greatest thing you can do to affect performance of a soldier across all those things is training. All right? So we're not the only ones. If you go back to the, the war in Vietnam, between 1965 and 1968, as we were bombing North Vietnam, the Air Force and the Navy suffered essentially equivalent loss exchange ratios in air-to-air -air combat. For every seven uh, enemy aircraft that we shot down, we lost two. So 1970 or 1968, that bombing was suspended. Part of, you know, let's negotiate. Kissinger goes to Paris, all those kinds of things. Both services looked at this and said, hey, look, you know, a, a, a 3.7 to 1 loss exchange ratio is not really good. We, you know, what can we do? The Air Force said, this is a technology problem. Let's work on our radars. Let's work on our AIM-7 and 8 missiles. Maybe let's put a gun in, in, internal to the aircraft, not external. The Navy said, not so fast, my friends. It's a training problem. They established the Advanced Fighters Weapon School at Naval Air Station Miramar. They also got a cool movie out of it, right? But their intent, it's kind of like our master gunner program, right? Let me bring in some, some fighter crews, train them in air-to-air -air combat, send them back to the fleet, and spread the knowledge. So in 1970, right, some negotiations didn't work. We go back to bombing North Vietnam in 1970. Guess what happened? The Air Force suffered essentially equivalent loss exchange ratios. The Navy's was improved by a factor of four. Okay? So training matters. Technology is neat. We, the United States, spend about 45% of what the world spends on defense. We have plenty of money. We spend more on defense than China and Russia combined. Okay? We're going to have good technology. It's America. Okay? It's training. Training matters. Okay? So we can talk about that. Uh, and formations, right? It's all about formations, right? You integrate warfighting functions in formations, right? You manage portfolios, unfortunately, because that's how we manage Army investments. It's terrible, but, you know, that's, that's what we do. But you put it together in formations. That's what matters. Uh, so you have to think of formations. We're focusing on the division. We need your help, right? If we're going to ask you to do something and we're not organizing you properly, raise your hand and say, hey, I need this. You know, we, we, we have our thesis. We have our ideas on what's important. We need your help to do that. But it's about formations. And it starts with those squads, those crews, those platoons, companies, and troops, and works their way back. There's a confluence, right? There's this friction between the MDMP Army, military decision-making process, and the battle drill army, okay? So how can I use machines? How can I use AI? How can I do those things to enable those guys who don't have scores of people to help them, all right? How, how can I do that? But it's all about formations, and, and we're excited about that. Subject to your questions, ladies and gentlemen, I'm excited about this. It's, it's you know, what we do for our formations, for our soldiers, for our army. It's, it's fun. It's exciting. It can be certainly frustrating, but it is, is, it is ever so rewarding, all right? And, and the, it's the Army's modernization. It's not ours. It's not the CG's. It's the Army's, right? So everybody has a stake in it. Everybody has a voice in it. Uh, and, and please use your position uh, to help us help us do this. Question, All right, sir. Brent. First question: uh, In your experience, what lessons do you think we should draw from previous modernization efforts, like the future combat system, that we should apply to current efforts for the maneuver force? I think the big thing about the big lesson from future combat system is focus on the big ideas, not the shiny things. Right. So if you look back at the at the thought of FCS, a very distributed battlefield, check. The employment of unmanned aerial and ground systems, check. Precision and an extended engagement, check. All right? But we got focused on 18 systems because guess what? That's where the money is. All right? That's where industry focused, right? And, and I love industry. We work with them every day, right? But, but their perspective is a little bit different than ours, right? So in this business, you have buyers, sellers, and consumers. We are all consumers. The acquisition core is the buyers and the industry is the sellers. We're all influenced by Congress. We're all influenced by other people. But those are the three tribes. Uh, and the consumer needs to, to have the largest say, right? Because we're either a happy consumer or we're a victim 
of, of that process. So it's incumbent upon us to be part of that process. Uh, but again, from FCS, the big ideas were good. We lost sight of it. Lots of reasons, right? Things take time. Some technology was not ready. You know, by the way, there's a war. Okay, so that, that, that's a problem. Uh, you know, for 52 months, the Army has been committed to our modernization priorities, right? October of 17 at AUSA, we announced those priorities. We established cross-functional teams. We identified the main effort, the priority effort. We're working that way. Uh, we just have to be cautious of, uh, you know, okay, are we fighting the plan? Are we fighting the enemy? All right? <clears throat> What's changed in the 52 months? Ask John Antall. What's changed in 52 months? Ask Ukraine. All right? So, again, keep, keep focused on the big idea. Uh, it's hard to change the Army. All right? So you go back to the Black Berets, right? General Sinsecki announced at AUSA in October, I want to put everybody in Black Berets. It took nine months to do it, right? Nine months to change a hat. When the Sergeant Major of the Army said, you don't have to wear it anymore, it took like nine minutes to take it off, okay? So we know there's a flash to bang, but if we at the senior leader, we gotta focus on what does it look like when we're done? I said 2030, it's, it's right here, right? In 18 months, our, you know, our input to our struck, you know, 2630 will be done, all right? So the leaders have left the building, the ideas have left the building. So now it's, it's how do we do that? Of course, you hear rearm, right? Regionally aligned, uh, regionally aligned Army modernization model, whatever we call it, right? So that's how we'll implement change, right? But it, you know, if you don't know what you're changing to, you may not be doing the right thing. So keep focused on the big ideas, and I think that's what we lost on FCS. Thank you, sir. I have another question on uh, mitigating uh, modernization seams between McSeated, which is functioning at the BCT level and below, and yeah. then AFC and other efforts at higher levels. Great. So. You talk about my headquarters. Is General McKean still? Oh, yeah. So, so here's, here's how I do that, right? Uh, you have Army processes, right? The total Army analysis process for organizational change. You have the POM and SPAR for budgets. Uh, you have all those, those processes. We've tried to change them several times in, our life, in, in my lifetime to no avail. That's fine. So if we stay focused on what's important to us, right? Soldiers and those formations, fire teams, crews, squads, platoons. If you stay focused on that, right? Then you can work through whatever process. If I got to go, if the, if the solutions route is through Army Forces, Futures Command, fine. If it's through Training and Doctor Command, fine. If it's directly to the Army staff, fine. Uh, it becomes frustrating, it may not be effective, but hey, we are a bureaucracy, so nothing's really efficient. Uh, but if we say, hey, what are we focused on, and then how do we, what process do we have to go through to change that, right? And that's the value of the Centers of Excellence, right? So if you go back to TRADOC, when they were established and we put branches back in responsibility for their branches, right? And with the COEs, we kind of consolidated like functions together, maneuver, uh, sustainment, uh, maneuver support. That's the lowest common denominator, right? So once it leaves the Center of Excellence, it has to, you know, engage through an army process. That's fine. I mean, it's, again, it's frustrating, but as a staff officer, that's the, you know, you stuff, suffer what you will. But if you stay focused and, and allow centers of excellence to think about it holistically, collectively, right? Because all those, you know, no, the last, the next person that shares all those letters is either the chief or the secretary or, or both of them. Nobody else shares all the letters, but the, the leaders that are here on the centers of excellence. So, Put it together, think of it as formations, work the process, be frustrated, do PT. So our next question, uh, do you have any concerns with the, at least the movement towards greater specialization in BCT types with uh, light, medium, Arctic, in addition to the traditional IA and SBCT, sir? Yeah, so, I mean, the question was about specialization. So I'm a Gemini, right? So I can feel, some people say I have two personalities, some people say I don't have any, but I say I can feel strongly both ways, right? So if you look at the sophistication and complexity of, of what we're asking our soldiers and leaders to do, you may wake up and say, that drives me to specialization, right? It's like, hey, this is just really too hard to just you know, be a, an afterthought. It's, you gotta be focused on it. The other thing is, well, look, you know, we're the biggest force, right? 1.1 million soldiers across the, 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 the components. Uh, I can't afford to be too specialized, right? You know. Uh, in fact, you know, we just, we just divested the mobile gun system out of the striker formations, right, for lots of reasons. But one of, you know, when you only have nine of those things in a brigade, I mean, they, they, they kind of fall out of, you know, they lose attention, right? So how do you focus on them? 
Were they crewed by 11s or 19s? The answer was yes over time, right? So we went back and forth. So there's a difficulty about being too specialized uh, and being too generalized, right? So that's why we defer to the branch commandants to kind of figure that out. It goes to retention, it goes to you know, uh, recruitment, it goes to how do we invest. It really affects training and leader development, right? So how many, how many Bradley Master Gunner courses am I gonna have? One or one for each version? How many are we gonna have when we start fielding OMFV? Uh, what are we gonna do with Striker Master Gunner, right? So it has impacts on the generating force as well. So there's no easy answer to that. Uh, but I think, again, if we focus on what it is we wanna give the combatant commander on the battlefield, right? Trained and ready formations to close with and destroy, to seize key terrain, to control populations, then we can figure out what's the best way to manage it. Cause I think specialization versus generalization is more toward personnel management and, and training and leader development. So I mean, it's no easy answer for Gemini. Thank you, sir. Any further questions from the conference room? Yes, ma'am. Um, so, letting out crossing or a specific um, <laughs> um, a great question. I defer to the Marine Corps, right? So, they, you know, they have fording kits on most all of their, their tactical wheel vehicles. <clears throat> you know, wet gag crossings, you know, penetration, those are all, I mean, they're all hard, right? I mean, it's crossing a linear danger area, right? So what do all I have to do that? Uh, so we have to look at it collectively, right? Are there M solutions that can help us besides bridging? Are there O or D doctrine solutions that can help us with this? Uh, there's no easy answer to that. Uh, I think, you know, again, that's just one task that has to be done on the battlefield. Uh, it helps us focus, right? So when we, when we first started talking about robotics a few years ago, we said, hey, let's look at a combined arms breach of a complex obstacle to, you know, is a, is a pretty well-defined and well-understood hard problem set to look at robotics, right? And that was useful to do that. Uh, designating two armored divisions reinforced to conduct penetrations is useful to help us, you know, size the army and focus. Uh, but, you know, we're gonna ask those divisions to do a lot more than just do a penetration, right? Um, but ma'am, since you asked that question, right, one thing I wanted to talk about was, you know, you talked about urbanization. Uh, uh, General Doherty talked about the atmospheric littoral, right, that low altitude airspace between the ground and, you know, pick an altitude, intimate contact with the ground, but avoiding the tyranny of terrain. How do you do that? Uh, that will help us, right? That will, I think, uh, bring back a degree of mobility to the tactical battlefield, especially in complex terrain by, by go, getting off the ground and getting into the low air, right? So we've been working JTARS, Joint Tactical Area Resupply System, right? Drones that can carry, I mean, we're carrying hundreds of pounds now, right? So it's pretty easy uh, to help solve some of the tactical distribution problems that we're gonna face. But yeah, so we, you know, again, I think as we look at those things, we have to say, hey, What's really the problem? And we have to look across all letters of the domain. I think Brett, you're gonna give me the hook, the shot clock's done. Hey, this is your force, maneuver force modernization team. Again, I've had the opportunity to be here for some time and don't take this wrong, General Costanza, but top to bottom, this formation is as, is as talented and passionate as anyone I've had the pleasure to serve with, right? Uh, so it's a great team. It's a great squad to be a member of. Uh, of course, General Costanza is, a, is, a, is a, an alumni of this formation as well. Uh, but that's, those are your guys and gals if you need to talk to them. Uh, and just last thing, all right? So you won't see any women on there, okay? So I need your help, right? I need your help to bring very talented women to help me think about some of these problems, right? Because we are responsible for all soldiers, not just, infra, you know, not just men, right? So it's easy for us to look at body armor and rifle stock length and all those other things. You know, I need, I need some, you know, some talented, some female officers and non-commissioned officers in our formation, right? So we're building that. Uh, so I'm just, you know, again, ad advertisement recruitment. You have somebody that's looking for work, you know, after their, their, their current job, they want to come to Fort Benning and be part of the team. We want them, we need them, okay? Uh, and, it, and it's very exciting. So again, thanks for the opportunity. The debate, the discussion, uh, the questioning is important uh, because without it, we won't make well-informed decisions or recommendations leading to good decisions. So uh, I'll be in the Army all day. If you need to follow up with something, sir, thanks. Brent, thanks. Thank you, sir.